Hey everyone, hope you're doing good. We are reading the Federalist Papers and it has been amazing so far. So we're going to pick up on Alexander Hamilton's essay, which was number nine. And the title was The Union as a Safeguard Against Domestic Faction and Insurrection. All right, towards page 38, towards the bottom. And the miserable objects of universal pity or contempt. Universal pity. Universal pity and contempt. Some of the writers who have come forward on the other side of the question seem to have been aware of the dilemma and have even been bold enough to hint at the division of the larger states as a de desirable thing. So the division of larger states, so I've heard people today advocate that they want to break California up into three chunks, you know, northern, middle, and southern. And I don't know about it, but people have talked about it. Such an infatuated policy, such a desperate expedient might, by the multiplication of petty offices, answer the views of men who possess no qualifications to extend their influence beyond the narrow circles of personal intrigue. But it could never promote the greatness or happiness of the people of America. So look at this. So they rather, they want to break everything up so they can have more narrow circles of influence for their own personal gain. And their happiness, I mean, their happiness outweighs the people's happiness, essentially, is what I'm getting from that. Referring the examination of the principle itself to another place, as has been already mentioned, it will be sufficient to remark here that, in the sense of the author, who has been most emphatically quoted upon the occasion, it would only dictate a reduction of the size of the more considerable members of the Union. Okay. But would not militate against their being... Look at how he... Would not militate, become militarized. What? A, wow. Against their being all comprehended in one Confederate government. And this is the true question, and the discussion of which we are at present interested. Look at that. In the discussion of which we are at present interested, the matter at hand. Man, he must have read Cicero. He's really good. So far are the suggestions of Montesquieu from standing in opposition to a general union of the states that he explicitly treats of a confederate republic as the expedient for extending the sphere of popular government. Okay, so Montesquieu contends that a confederate republic is going to be more fast and efficient and vast, vast and efficient in a way that will facilitate uh, populism and reconciling the advantage of monarchy with those of republicanism. Oh, so sort of a hybrid between monarchists and republicanists in one just confederate republic. I don't know if that would work. I don't think that would work. Maybe, I mean, let's see. It is very probable, says he, that mankind would have been obliged at length to live constantly under the government of a single person had they not contrived a kind of constitution that has all the internal advantages of a republican, together with the external force of monarchical government. I mean a confederate republic. Okay, so here's the thing, though. The constitution versus a king... That's going to be, then what, sometimes you got to wonder, what would be the need of it? It would just be a prime minister, right? Or a president. Because the king, I mean, they have this sort of absolute power, I mean, traditionally. So they could override a confederate choice. I mean, one could argue semantically about who has more power, the prime minister or the queen, one being the symbolic figurehead, one being the actual, you know, logistical powerhouse. Depends. We could get into that, but let's see what he says further. This form of government is a convention by which several smaller states agree to become members of a larger one. Hmm. So, so 
sort of what the tribes did, which they intend to form. It is a kind of assemblage of societies that constitute a new one. Okay, that's when the Republic comes in, maybe, on the Confederate one. Capable of increasing by means of new associations till they arrive to such a degree of power as to be able to provide for the security of the united body. So the Confederacy's providing security for everyone as a whole because when you mingle them together, he's contending they'll create new associations, therefore new bonds, therefore new trades, therefore money will be exchanged, which will bond them in commerce, maybe. Maybe that's what he means, too. A republic of this kind, able to withstand an external force, so military-wise, so they would rally together. But see, that's the hard part. Will they rally together to fight the external force? Or, since they're all, you know, jealousy, like he put it, jealous and chaotic, maybe they will branch off on that outside force. They'll say, hey, who's going to support us more? The new external force or the existing internal force? Hmm. May support itself without any internal corruptions. The form of this society prevents all manner of inconveniences. I mean, nothing can prevent all manners of inconveniences, I'd argue. If a single member should attempt to usurp the supreme authority, he could not be supposed to have an equal authority and credit in all the confederate states. Or so we hope. I mean, states are going rogue now. Democrat states versus Republican states. And the left-wing California fanatics are challenging other places and then in Minneapolis they had you know they allowed their police precinct to be taken over so I don't know you they didn't have the, the the power to take on the supreme authority of the United States government because the military could have stomped them out but people now have discredited that state with being lawless so that would mean they wouldn't have equal authority that's a modern example but let's see where he takes us. Were he to have too great influence over one, this would alarm the rest. H hopefully, hopefully, right? But one could argue that the economy of California with Silicon Valley has higher influence, but that doesn't really alarm many enough, perhaps. Were he to subdue a part that which would still remain free might oppose him with forces independent of those which he had usurped, if there's any independent forces left, and overpower him before he could be settled in his usurpation. Overpower one before they can become settled in their, you know, usurped throne. Ah. Should a popular insurrection happen in one of the Confederate states, the others are able to quell it. So we hope. So we hope. But what do you do though when, like he said, others are ready for acquiescence. They don't want to fight. Some are ready to submit to that uh, one that's conducting such an insurrection, right? I mean, especially when it's built off different... Wow. Just wow. Should abuses creep into one part, they are reformed by those that remain sound. If there's any remaining sound, though, see? We would so hope, right, that they could creep in there, reform it, and say, Hey, you guys are acting up. We don't like what you're doing. The cancer you're breeding in your state is spreading to other states. Your ideologies are sick. Knock it off. But when you have a more gig economy, that's harder because now it can creep in via the media, via apps, right? Does, people don't even have to move to those physical locations to make such ideas. The state may be destroyed on one side and not on the other. The Confederacy may be dissolved and the Confederates preserve their sovereignty. As this government is composed of small republics, it enjoys the internal happiness of each. Small republics, that's cute. And with respect to its external situation, it is possessed by means of the association of all the advantages of large monarchies. Mm. Small republics being happy 
respecting each other's situations and then they have their association bond and because of that they get an advantage of a larger monarchy I mean maybe quite interesting 